So, so we'll, let's begin with uh, this talk on uh, exploring challenges in uh, thinking about sort of freestanding oxide membranes and what are the kind of new physics that one can see in these systems. So, Wonderful. Thank you very much again, Arun. And I want to again take a moment to thank the organizer for having me here. This is great so far. And whether I just can't believe I'm traveling from Delhi a few days ago to Bangalore and I was kind of shocked. My body was annealed in a different direction. Um, just to appreciate this, how cool the weather is here. Anyway, I, today I'm, I'm planning to actually continue talking about synthesis of quantum materials, but in the context of membrane. Um, yesterday, some of you may have heard about, you know, I talked mostly about the technique, how they can introduce the defects in the material, how do we actually study the structure of the material, how they connect to the properties and why they are all important. So today I'm gonna to build upon some of those discussion and talk particularly about freestanding single crystalline membrane of oxide, particularly complex oxide. What are the opportunity and challenges? Challenges in the context of synthesis and handling them. So once again, this is my lab. We have a five molecular beam taxi system. Three of them are shown here. Two of them are most broken equipment. They are mostly broken, still MBE. Um, and you can see here, this is one of them, which is mostly focused on ruthenates, titanates, iridates, type of material we are making, 3D, 4D, and 5D metal oxide. And this is the joint uh, two, two MB system, dual chamber with the load lock and with the buffer chamber and a load lock, which allows us to do a, a synthesis of membrane of all of these various materials, um, as well as we also have electron beam evaporation, so we can do metal metallization all within you know this two chamber without exposing them to air which is very powerful and then part of my lab is also dedicated for characterizing these structures um, uh, using uh, uh, SEM uh, scanning probe microscopy as well as Dynacol which is for transport measurement. I want to thank the uh, agencies Air Force as well as Department of Energy uh, as well as this 2D crystal consortium at uh, Penn State MIP Center for uh, for uh, you know for help, uh, these two agencies support the work and this has been helpful in providing some 2D material which I'm gonna talk about. All right, so I want to actually motivate my talk by uh, bringing this particular uh, uh, fact that epitaxy offer integration of multifunctionality. And we have heard a lot about this already in the last two days, is that uh, epitaxy is one way to integrate various material into uh, uh, with each other. And here I'm picking up one snapshot of one of this uh, device stack where you can see wafer, channel, dielectric material, and a metal electrode. And this is typically the stack that people use for functional devices, where you need all these different functions to make a fully functional device, for example, FET. Now, one thing that uh, when you think about this kind of uh, structure, one thing that you right away want is you want each of these layers, each of this channel, and dielectric and electrode, to be defect free, quote unquote, defect free. Um, at the same time, you want this interface to be of, uh, of low defect or uh, quote unquote defect free, right? And how you can achieve that, if you have a epitaxial capability uh, way to integrate them, you can actually get uh, interfaces with low amount of structural defect or, or no structural defect. Okay, um, in that context, if you think about complex oxide, uh, that's probably one of the reasons why people like complex oxide because of the flexibility they offer. And what I'm showing here, you can see the lattice parameter landscape for various complex oxide. They are color coded with regard to different function. And you can see all channel, dielectric, as well as metallic function. You can get into a, a, from a complex oxide with a similar crystal structure and a similar lattice parameter, meaning you can stack them on top of each other without creating interfacial defect. And that's really powerful way to integrate functionality of various materials into one heterostructure. So that really rocks. So epitaxy is very important. Now, uh, if you continue to think about epitaxial uh, perovskite oxide, you will find they are also interesting for other application. For example, uh, some of these complex oxide can induce very large charge density. Uh, what do I mean by that? I'm showing here is the charge accumulation as a function of capacitance per unit area for a device with uh, this configuration. And you can see that some of this complex oxide, they falls right up here 
where they are capable in practice, in, in theory, um, to induce much higher charge density and much higher capacitance. And that's again important for modulation of charges and model, modulating phases, using charges and so on. So that's, that's one aspect. Some of these materials are also ferroelectric, so you can have a spontaneous reversible polarization and switchable. Um, uh, likewise, you know, some of these material uh, which are great at room temperature, if you think about high temperature electronic application, they also are uh, quite interesting as you can see here in this plot, the dielectric constant as a function of temperature for some of this prototype complex oxide, you can see the dielectric constant remains hundreds, even at temperature as high as, uh, you know, uh, exceeding 500 degrees Celsius. Whereas conventional dielectric material like hafnium oxide, they start to go really bad when you think about high temperature application. So if you want to use some of this material for high temperature electronics, again, they can be a promising material. So now you know just in a, in a, uh, uh, in a quick uh, uh, overview of this complex oxide, they are good. They are useful for, for, for some of the uh, functional reason I mentioned. But when you think about epitaxy of this material, uh, this is something I mentioned in study, uh, that there are some limitations and that's listed here. Think about you putting a material on top of a subset. You can think about all this limitation with regard to flexibility, strain, subset, and men making 3D arch architecture of, of the functional film. Likewise, you can also think about dislocation as a potential issue in epitaxy. If your film is mismatched with the subset, you can create a periodic or random dislocation, misfit and threading dislocations. Uh, in your functional film, which may be undesirable for what you are looking, uh, what you are using your film for. Likewise, if you think about epitaxy of, of material one on material two versus material two on material one, those interfaces can be different. And that has been well understood also in the past for the reason nucleation and growth um, can be different depending on where, what is your uh, uh, starting layer. So that's again challenges of epitaxy. So, I just highlighted some of the potential uh, advantages and potential challenges of, uh, of epitaxial system. Uh, so with that sort of backdrop, I want to now move on and tell you about th how freestanding membrane can overcome those challenges. And this is what is illustrated and bring some more challenges, some new challenge. So you can see here when you detach your film from the subject, you can remove all these limitations and enable various functionality here. Um, that's shown here schematically, where you can think about now um, having a freestanding membrane, we can create a ripples, different type of strain state, which is something you cannot do so easily in epitaxial system. You can also think about creating a, a, a more type of structures where you have a 3D material on top of another 3D material. So you may have a long range interaction uh, within this material from uh, far away from the interface that can be interesting. You can also think about studying the individual point defects. Imagine now you have a few layers of three dimensional oxide and you are channeling your beam through the, some of this membrane. Now you have only one or two layer, three layers. You can actually visualize individual point defects. That can be very powerful. Um, uh, again, uh, study uh, using a membrane type of uh, uh, architecture. Uh, at the same time, you can also think about attaching some of these oxide membrane with the 2D material or, or 3D material or any other substrate which can be also useful. So now when it comes to some of this, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to various uh, membrane and, and studying all this physics or functionality, a couple of things right away you have to think from the synthesis point of view. And that's what again I, I showed yesterday and I'm briefly telling you here is you need to think about how to synthesize a defect managed uh, thin films or thin membrane of this material. You need to also think about how to exfoliate and transfer them. And then you need to think about how to handle them without uh, contaminating them, without ruining the surfaces and so on. So with that sort of a, you know, a backdrop in mind, I'm gonna share with you what are the state of the art technique that people use and how we and what we have been contributing in that direction. So briefly telling you about how people synthesize this material uh, in a freestanding membrane. Uh, uh, one way to do that, you take a, a single crystalline subset, you put a single crystalline epitaxial layer on top of it, which I'm calling sacrificial layer. And now you grow a film, which is epitaxial to the sacrificial. 
At the end of the day, you dissolve the sacrificial layer to detach your film from the substrate. That's one way. Another way is called remote epitaxy or 2D layer assist liftoff, where you think about you have ionic crystals as a substrate. You put a two-dimensional wonder wall material like graphene. You have a, a penetration of electric uh, uh, surface potential through this 2D layer, which allow the epitaxy of, of your functional material on. That's the concept of two-dimensional uh, remote epitaxy. And the third one is well-known, uh, spall-in, where you are putting a, some sort of stressor layer and then you are creating a stress and removing a, um, a layer of film uh, from top of your layer. So that's a spall-in process. So I'm gonna tell you about all, uh, uh, not all of them, but two of this, this uh, technique and how, what we have done uh, more recently in the context of all these particular uh, scientific questions. Okay, so what is sacrificial layer method? Uh, once again, you take a substrate, you put a sacrificial layer, you put a functional material epitaxial to the sacrificial layer, you put them into a DI water often, or any other chemical solvent, uh, where the sacrificial layer dissolve, removing, uh, uh, detaching your film from the substrate, you transfer that film onto a plastic substrate or any other host substrate, and now you got a freestanding film, okay? Um, what people have been doing for complex oxide as a choice of sacrificial layer, they have been using this kind of sacrificial layer. This is the work actually started in 2016 from a group in Stanford, uh, Harold Wong. He came up with this uh, strontium aluminum oxide as a sacrificial layer and then there were several other sacrificial layer which also were developed, which are dissolved not just in DI water but some other so uh, solvent, uh, chemical solvent. And now you look at all the sacrificial layer and you look their lattice parameter, you'll find them they vary from about 3.8 to about 4.1. And so for some of you who make oxide material, you will realize this is wonderful range of lattice parameter because most of the oxides uh, that we deal with, they have a lattice, uh, perovskite oxide, they have a lattice parameter somewhere around this range of lattice parameter. So this is all good, right? Now the question is, if I think about this sacrificial layer and see in the literature what has been done, you will find something really uh, surprising. You will find that most of the work that had been done using this sacrificial layer, they have used a technique called pulse laser deposition. And there's a barely some work, less than 10% work done in, by a technique like molecular beam epitaxy. Question is why? And I think answer is obvious. We briefly talked about it yesterday is that molecular beam epitaxy is a technique which require individual elements to be supplied and then they, you control their fluxes to make complex stoichiometry. So of course, you don't want to create all this complex stoichiometric material with a lot of pain just to sacrifice it and that doesn't make sense. So that's main, mainly the reason is, uh, is, is uh, uh, using MB, uh, providing some of these elements inside MB chamber is non -treat. So question is, can we simplify this process for molecular beam epitaxy using a simpler sacrificial layer or do something else, right? Something more creative. So one approach could be, uh, let's not use this complex sacrificial layer, rather start to use some binary sacrificial layer, which are really simple to make um, in any technique, including MBE, or try to create the sacrificial layer ex situ by solution method, put them inside MBE system, do some tricks, maybe solid phase epitaxy, use them as a template to grow single crystalline material. And both of them uh, potentially can solve the issue of, uh, of handling this complex sacrificial. Now, with this question in mind, uh, what I'm gonna tell you first about the use of binary oxide as a sacrificial layer. And you'll see right here, again in the lattice parameter plot, uh, which goes from now 2.9 to 5.2, a large range of, range of lattice parameter. This is what has been obtained so far. When you add binary oxide, they cover wider range of lattice parameters. So there's a wide tunability of lattice parameter now you got. Okay, so uh, can they be useful for oxide? Absolutely yes, but they can also be useful uh, as a sacrificial layer to grow epitaxial Huesler alloys where they lie somewhere here or somewhere up here. So you can actually go beyond oxide using this sacrificial layer. And they are very simple to grow. So that's, that's what we thought. And we thought, you know, that's, that's all good, but can you grow this binary oxide epitaxial to the sum of the oxide substrate? And then on top of this rock salt, can you grow again a functional perovskite oxide? 
Those were the scientific questions we had. So that's what we did. We first went ahead and chose lanthanum aluminate as a substrate and we put a layer of, a few layers of 11 nanometer of strontium oxide here and then we grew strontium titanate on top. All inside in, in the same chamber in one go and you can see here is the reflection high energy electron diffraction in C2 read uh, of strontium oxide after growth. It looks epitaxy to the substrate in plane and this is the STO film after growth on strontium oxide again is epitaxial. We also did the post XRD and you can see we see single crystalline strontium oxide peak and this is the STO peak and then subshape peak. All good. We also looked it up uh, in XRR, X-ray reflectivity measurement and you can see this uh, Kaizik fringes in reflectivity. We see nice Kaizik fringes, we can fit them and we get the information about the thickness of individual layers. Film after growth on this sacrificial look atomic lisp. We went ahead and also grew these films on a different subject now, LSAT. And here we use uh, two nanometer, just barely two nanometer of strontium oxide. And you can see once again, we can make a phase pure single crystalline epitaxial strontium titanate film on strontium oxide, which is not visible here because it's so thin, um, uh, grown on LSAT subject. And film is again atomically smooth with the RMS of 0.2 nanometer. All good, right? Now question is, what is the epitaxial relationship between this ep uh, sacrificial layer and the underlying substrate? Something which is well established, you can do a technique, a phi scan using x-rays. And we did that, we found this is actually the epitaxial relationship where the binary oxide is 45 degree rotated onto the substrate to min minimize the mismatch. And, uh, and that's how it grows and on top of strontium oxide, then you grow strontium type, okay? So all looks good. We went ahead and looked them up in TEM and found films were kind of crappy. Um, you will see this, there are a lot of contrast here in this uh, LADF and uh, a high analog, angle analog dark field stem image. And those contrasts are coming from uh, so-called threading dislocations. And that's not surprising to us because we intentionally chose strontium oxide as a sacrificial layer to grow strontium titanate and they are so lattice mismatch that this is not surprising that we have a lot of dislocation. Question is can we use better sacrificial layer so that we can avoid some of this crazy thing happening in the films, right? We went ahead and now developed barium oxide as I showed you a wide spectrum of lattice parameter using this binary oxide sacrificial layer. There is one barium oxide which is right there at strontium titanate. But barium oxide is very reactive. If you take it out, it start to uh, degrade. So you have to do all inside vacuum. And once you have done your growth, take it out, immediately exfoliate it or handle that in a, in a some inert atmosphere, otherwise that can degrade. So we did that and we grew a bunch of film heterostructures. Here is one example of barium calcium oxide as a sacrificial layer. Why calcium? Because we can also tune the lattice parameter of buffer layer and then grew a heterostructure of calcium stannate strontium titanate for the reason I'm not going to discuss here. Uh, but point I want to emphasize, we can again use this kind of sacrificial layer and grow complex oxide on top of it, which are all epitaxial. This is the reed and this is, uh, this is the x-ray diffraction. Is it that uh, sacrificial layer you wanted to be barium calcium oxide? We wanted barium calcium oxide because we wanted to also, oops, um, we also wanted to change the lattice parameter of the sacrificial layer on to a substrate, which is what I'm showing here, with as you can see, yeah, with addition of calcium. And that allowed us to do that. As you can see, this is a small amount of calcium. This is a higher amount of calcium, so we can tune the lattice. Okay, so this is just to test whether calcium oxide can also work and it actually works. So um, uh, all of this work. Um, uh, now the question was, uh, is can we take this epitaxially grown film onto the sacrificial layer and dissolve into a water? This is what we did. We first put the supporting layer, which is a thermal release tape with the help of PMMA and put this into a water and detach our functional film from the substrate. When you do that, you can transfer that functional film onto a gold coated silicon, which is what we did here. You can see we get a pretty high yield, about five by five millimeter, with lots of crack though, 
but we get entire membrane to be detached. And this is the X-ray diffraction, again showing nothing unusual, it's just showing that we have uh, everything that you ex would expect from this structure, which is STO grown on, uh, STO film transferred onto a gold titanium silicon substrate. This is the fine scan of the film, uh, which is of this structure on transferred onto a silicon. Again, you can see this is just the film substrate signal is gone, which was used for growth. Now, uh, we went ahead and uh, uh, also looked this up uh, for films grown on ALSAT and using LAO. Once again, you can see these films we can grow, uh, uh, we can transfer onto a silicon, and the only film peak we are getting is the STU film. So it actually worked. That's the point I want to make. We went ahead and did the TM of membrane. There's a low area scan I'm showing, a very small area, but essentially it looks a uh, 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 phase pure single crystalline STO membrane as you'd expect. We did the AFM of four by four micron at several places on both sides of the membrane, on the one which is interfaced with the strontium oxide during growth, and the one which is the top surface of strontium oxide. And both of these interfaces may be different, all right? Uh, you can see both of them are nominally, uh, uh, you know, atomically flat with, with the RMS roughness of about 0.3 nanometer. Okay, so both interfaces are good. Uh, but what was remarkable in this process is the following. We found that people who have been using strontium aluminum oxide, they use about a day or more or around that time to dissolve this sacrificial layer, whereas in our case, some of this sacrificial layer dissolve in less than five minutes. So if you're dealing with functional oxide, which are air, which are water sensitive or solution sensitive, you can see using this kind of sacrificial layer can already be useful because they do not require to be dipped for longer than a few minutes. Whereas if you use this one, it requires several hours of dipping to separate film from the sacrificial layer. Okay, so all good. We went ahead and now um, started asking a question, what is the properties of this membrane that we have made? And a couple of things that, uh, as we were talking yesterday, you can do electrical transport measurement, you can do dielectric measurement, to understand what is the defect and structural quality of these films. We did that. Uh, we first did the bulk uh, dielectric constant measurement uh, uh, from this stack, where we have STO transfer onto a metal electrode on silicon. This is how the X-ray diffraction looked like. We went ahead, did the impedance, uh, impedance spectroscopy as a function of frequency. This is what is shown. This is the phase angle, which is minus 90. It's capacitor-like. This is the usual mathematical expression we use. You can think about a, 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 you know, effective circuit here uh, where you have a one interface here, one interface here. You can do a thickness series to really ec extract the intrinsic dielectric constant of STO without having a contribution from other interface, which we did. And from the thickness series, you can see it fits to give an intrinsic dielectric constant of about 280, 280, which is close to the bulk, which is about 300. So films look good. We also collaborated with, uh, with our colleague, um, uh, Alex MacLeod at, in physics at the uh, University of Minnesota. He did the uh, uh, you know, measurement of, uh, of complex dielectric function. And here is a membrane and bulk. You can see essentially they also look similar. Again, the membrane possesses the same dielectric properties as that of the uh, bulk transient type. So all good so far, right? We went ahead, applied the same approach now to other functional oxide, barium titanate. You can see this is the barium titanate membrane. Looks kind of, uh, you know, not kind of, it's quite big membrane. We can exfoliate. They are all single crystalline barium titanate membrane of various thicknesses we, we can get. We can write erase using PFM. PFM is not the way to tell whether they are ferroelectric or not but the barium titanate should be ferroelectric. We are doing PE loop and that will confirm whether they are really ferroelectric or not, but they are very likely ferroelectric. Okay, so this is one approach that we have developed using binary oxide. There's another approach that you can think about, which will also simplify our life and allows us to use molecular bimaptaxy to grow your functional material. And that's approach is here. Where what we did, we said, all right, if I want to grow this material inside MBE system, I'm going to use all my life just to optimize this stoichiometry, and that's not good. So we collaborated with a group of Mariona Call at Spain, in Spain, and where they use essentially a solution-based method to make 
this sacrificial layer where they spin coat it, very simple. They ship it to us, we take that sample, put it into our, in our MB chamber, do annealing and develop the process where the idea was maybe some of this amorphous spinned material will get epitaxy directed by the underlying crystalline substrate. So do a solid phase epitaxy. We didn't know whether it will work or not, but we thought it should work or it may work. So we went ahead and loaded this at, uh, and, and here is the reflection energy electron diffraction of the film. It, no signal you can see, it's amorphous. Went ahead and started heating it up and you can see as it goes to about 950, you start to see a streaky like pattern from something which was amorphous to start with. So we turned something which was amorphous to a crystalline with a nice tricks. And I do want to emphasize some of these films that I'm talking here, they were kept in our desiccator for more than a year, almost a year. Um, and even after that, we could recover the surface. So this is very powerful. Um, so you can use a solution based sacrificial layer to, to synthesize some of this. Absolutely right. In the presence of oxygen plasma. That's what we did. So it does work. Now the question was, can you grow a single crystalline film on top of this recovered crystalline sacrificial layer surface? And answer is yes. And you can see here is we did grow of STO on this recovered uh, uh, SCAO substrates or CSO they call. We get a nice layer by layer growth of strontium titanate, which is nice. Film after growth and during growth looks streaky. After growth, you can see a re a XRD, again, single crystalline epitaxial film in Z direction. This is on axis scan. This is AFM, again, showing it's a smooth. We went ahead and took this film, and now we use this template, uh, which I was just talking about, this template, grew intentionally one film, which was stoichiometric, another film, which was strontium deficient and we transfer them onto a gold coated substrate like this. So you can see here stoichiometric film has a bulk like lattice parameter where strontium deficient film has a slightly expanded lattice parameter. Now the question was, are these membrane with a slight amount of non stoichiometric difference, they are different in functional properties. And there had been already known in from epitaxy that if strontium titanate goes, uh, point, has a point effect, they may turn ferroelectric or polar. Okay, um, and you will see that uh, this strontium deficient sample, we did the PFM and we do see a, a weak signal here, which, which is again consistent with the polar region being uh, present in strontium deficient strontium type. Okay, whereas this was not available in stoichiometric film. So there's a very important rule of stoichiometry on uh, dielectric uh, functionality of, of strontium titanate which is something to keep in mind, especially if you are keeping your membrane for a long time and for dissolving buffer layer, which may also leach out some of the strontium during uh, exfoliation process that can already change the properties of your film uh, once it comes into the form of a membrane. So one has to be very careful, especially if you are putting your film for longer time in water or any solvent. So that was nice. We went ahead now, um, we have done more work here. I want to actually now move on and talk about the third approach people use and our own group uses to synthesize membrane. And that has been a very uh, controversial um, approach uh, which people call remote epitaxy. So I do want to take a moment to illustrate what is the concept behind re remote epitaxy is you have a substrate and substrate if it's ionic substrate, you will think about there is a surface potential and when you put a layer of 2D material, that surface potential can still penetrate through this 2D material. And if that is the case, you shower your atoms inside the MB chamber or inside your vacuum technique, uh, you will maintain epitaxial growth because of those inter penetrating surface potential. Okay, so now you have epitaxial film then 2D material and your substrate. Clearly this interface is weakly bonded because of the presence of 2D material. Now you can separate them. You can create a freestanding membrane, reuse the substrate. You can do fun stuff with the freestanding membrane. Something that we have already talked about. Now, all good. You can also think about if this is all true, the process of 
of strain relaxation at this interface, especially for heteroepitaxy, would be very different than in case of real epitaxial system without 2D layer. Because you are relaxing your strain probably spontaneous, I don't know, maybe gradually or spontaneously here. So you may even, uh, uh, you know, modify the misfit dislocation or threading dislocation in your heteroepitaxial system in case of remote epitaxy, which is very fascinating if you think about it because it may allows you to grow a defect free films um, uh, using remote epitaxy. Kind of strains that you're talking about when you talk about extreme strain engineering? Yeah, so uh, it can be of the order of about 10% or so. We have not gone there, but you know, group of, uh, of uh, Harold Wong, they have actually stretched some of this mem membrane way beyond, I think, I don't remember exact number, but way beyond 6%, five to 6%. Okay, so all good. Now question is, can you do the oxide, a remote epitaxy of oxide? And again, this is something not a rocket science, very simple to understand. You can see you are throwing oxygen, your other metal of interest. This oxygen at high temperature can oxidize the heck out of your graphene. And that's not good. So how do you do remote epitaxy if you have oxygen around? What we did, we went to a technique, hybrid MB, where we said, let's not supply any additional oxygen here. Rather, oxygen can be supplied in the, with the other elements. Here we are using a chemical precursor for titanium, where you can see oxygen is already bonded. Now you supply TTIP, this titanium tetraisopropoxide, in the presence of strontium flux. And by doing so, you can create a strontium titanate thin films on strontium titanate substrate or any other substrate. Here I'm showing the result of that growth series, where we are growing STO on top of STO substrate. And you can see without any additional oxygen, we can still get a nice growth window where film is self-regulating or has automated uh, stoichiometric control. So all good. Um, so uh, once we found this nice growth window, we were of course quite happy because we don't have to now worry about flux instability causing a stoichiometry issue. That was very nice. Um, now the question was, of course, when we, uh, you know, what is the quality of these films? Again, this is something I showed briefly yesterday. Uh, the film that we grow using this hybrid approach, um, this was grown with plasma. Uh, you can see film grows nice layer by layer fashion. This is the recent growth uh, uh, grown film of strontium titanate grown using this method. We have a record high electron mobility about 50,000 in thin film of STO. Uh, we also have a record high dielectric constant in thin films of STO grown using hybrid, exceeding that of the bulk. These are the world record right now. So the technique work. Now the question is, does graphene survive? That's the next question. So I'm gonna walk you through the process. First thing we do is we make our own graphene using a, a CVD process. We wet transfer them in this fashion. We use a copper, we do a, a then dissolve the copper using a HN transfer that graphene onto a, onto a substrate using wet process. Then if I want a bilayer graphene, I repeat the process once again, and you get a bilayer graphene. Once we have a graphene, you want to know whether you have a graphene, you can use a well-established method, Raman. We do that where we come with a laser and we scan in X, Z direction to identify where the graphene is, and you can see Graphene, we can identify where we fix that XZ position and then do a XY scan to know the uniformity of graphene. And once again, you can see the 2D peak, although we also have a defect peak in graphene, but essentially it looks quite uniform graphene. Again, the resolution of Raman, you have to keep in mind, these are not uh, nanometer uh, resolution. These are probably several micron, and that's what we are looking at, okay? Uh, this is the scale, it's a two micron. So now once we have this, this graphene onto a subset, we, we loaded that into the vacuum chamber, once again here, and we started growing strontium titanate, TTIP and strontium, no oxygen. We went ahead and looked this up in read, and you can see STO and STO read looks streaky, STO on monolayer graphene read looks streaky, STO grown on bilayer graphene on STO, also there are some streaks here. We also did the same thing on ALSAT subset, you can see there are some fence streak here. So it looks like film has grown in the presence of graphene layer on top of, uh, of the subject. Okay, now question was, uh, is if graphene has survived, we should be able to detach this film from the subject. Otherwise film will get strongly bonded to the subject. 
We did that, and you can see we can nicely detach the film as shown here. Um, this is a film on a Kapton tape, no substrate. We can also transfer them onto a completely different substrate. Here is the uh, TEM with uh, Scott Chambers group. Um, you can see graphene survived here, carbon exists, and also the interface between sapphire and STO looks decent. Okay, so so far I've shown you that seems like we can grow STO film on graphene and we can detach that STO from the substrate, suggesting that layer of STO is grown on graphene and graphene has not oxidized. That's all I've said, right? So we went ahead and did the, uh, we, after we removed the STO substrate, we did the AFM of the remaining substrate, which has a graphene on it. And you can see the surface looks actually dirty. These are PMMA residue from wet transfer graphene, but graphene was present everywhere on five by five millimeter substrate. This is a Raman scan. So graphene did not come with STO, rather it remained stuck to the STO substrate. Why? That's another question we can talk about. But now the question becomes, okay, you have made something on top of graphene, how did you make it? Is it really remote epitaxy? Is it pinhole assisted epitaxy or is it wonder wall epitaxy? And we had a beautiful talk about wonder wall epitaxy yesterday uh, from Vidya, um, but I'm gonna introduce these three concepts once again very briefly and focus last three minutes um, on mechanism through which these membranes are growing, okay? So here is the remote epitaxy concept. You have substrate, you have a layer of 2D material, and then due to the interpenetrated uh, surface potential, you are growing film with the same uh, structure as that of the underlying substrate. In case of wonderful epitaxy, you are essentially growing your 3D film influenced by your 2D material, nothing to do with the underlying substrate. So you are getting a, 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 you know, influenced by the graphene itself, for example. Or in case of pinhole assisted epitaxy, think about you have a hole within the graphene. So part of the film grows through the hole and then directly in this direction, and then it start to grow laterally onto the graphene through a lateral epitaxial overgrowth, okay? And that can also result into a growth of this material on top of, of 2D material, which can potentially be exfoliated because this link can be weak, okay? So now the question is what we have made, what is going on? Is it this, this, or this? That's the question I'm emphasizing. Now, to answer that question, this is uh, uh, probably one of the grand challenges since the field started uh, on remote epitaxy is what is really the mechanism? There had been a lot of argument and what we think there are remote epitaxy. That's outset, I can tell you. And I'll walk you through our thought process here. So this is how we designed the experiment. This is a subshit. If you have a layer of graphene, graphene, if you try to grow STO on just a, hexa, a hexagonal graphene, it tried to grow 0, 0, 001. And there, there had been already a study established there. So STO grows 0, 0, 001 in a wonder wall epitaxial fashion um, uh, if you grow on directly on graphene. But if there's a remote epitaxy, then the orientation of STO should be the same as the orientation of the substrate. Whether, and if it's a direct epitaxy, then the STO film that you're growing should have the same orientation as that of the substrate. Meaning, if I'm growing, let's say, STO substrate and trying to grow STO film on top, wonder wall epitaxy will give you 0, 0, 001. Remote epitaxy will also give you 0, 0, 001, and direct epitaxy will also give you 0, 0, 001. We did that, and here is what you can see. We get just 001 for film grown on bilayer graphene on STO substrate, making our life complicated. What is going on? Is it which one of these responsible for this? But now you can be smart. You can say, all right, let's change STO with LSAT 110. Now, if you have a wonder wall epitaxy, this STO will remain 001. But remote epitaxy will give you 110, direct epitaxy will give you 110. That's what it should be. And now we did the XRD and we found 001 is surely there. And we also found 110 film, meaning we definitely have wonder wall epitaxy in addition to maybe remote and direct epitaxy. So one thing we've definitely 
pointed out here clearly that in this film that we have showed you, there is a Wonder Wall epitaxy exist. And there's a major, major part of the film are grown using Wonder Wall epitaxy. Oops. So can I take another one minute? Um, so now question is how do you differentiate between remote epitaxy and direct epitaxy? So the way you can do it, think about it, you have grown remote epitaxy where your film is here, right? And you have grown direct epitaxy where film is attached to this subject. And you exfoliate, now you exfoliate this film. If it's a remote epitaxy, it will get attached to this and get exfoliated. If it's a direct epitaxy, it's not gonna come up, okay? So we did that and we made this, uh, this, this uh, stressor layer and exfoliated. After that, we essentially went ahead and did the SEM and EBSD of those exfoliated film at various location. This is how it should look like if it's a remote epitaxy. And this is the SEM at various site and you can see, we see 001 which is red color, but we also see a large amount of the film here or some amount of the film which are green, which consistent with 110 orientation. So, which can only be explained if we have a remote epitax. Okay, um, uh, but certainly there is a uh, there is a uh, there is a wonder wall epitaxy. So now you may ask, maybe you have a remote epitaxy, but it's it's uh, spalling is also playing a role. We rule that out by actually doing a uh, controlled experiment where we put the STO directly on LSAT and we did the same process and we tried to uh, exfoliate and we do not see any evidence of uh, spalling of film from LSAT substrate. So that rule out that spalling is playing a role that again suggests it's a remote epitaxy. We went ahead and did some bunch of experiment. I know I'm running out of it, uh, running out of time. We ruled out there's also no lateral epitaxial overgrowth, which may also result into exfoliation of 110 by doing a, some systematic experiment where we put the, we, we pattern the graphene, we grew a film. If it's a lateral growth, you should expect something like this. If it's a straight, no lateral growth, you should expect like this kind of growth. We did bunch of uh, experiment here and based on si series of experiment, we ruled out that there is no lateral overgrowth is happening in this film. Okay, so uh, the point I want to make based on what we have shown, that STO film that I just presented to you through remote in epitaxy is part of them are growing through remote interaction and a lot of them are also growing through wonder wall interaction or direct epitaxy. So this suggests that remote epitaxy is actually indeed possible using a large area scale method, not using a TEM type of approaches, which is local approach. So with that, um, I want to stop by showing we have moved in the direction of using this membrane where we are taking some of these membrane, rotating them, creating a more structure. This is a TEM, defocused series TEM, where you can see, we can see at the interface, more a pattern forming, and they start to show unusual properties in eels and so on. I'm not gonna talk about that. So here is my take home message. I think it's time for membrane, MB rocks, membrane rocks. Here is my selling point. Sorry to be really blunt. Um, here is the summary of my, of my talk. I hope I've shown you that there are, uh, there are a lot of opportunity in material science. Uh, what I've shown you is, is uh, remote evidence of remote epitaxy. I've also shown you record high electron mobility and dielectric constant. We have shown uh, you know, that more structure can be created and uh, ways to create various membrane using different methods. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to uh, thank all my group member. These are the funding agencies which support uh, the work. Uh, and here is some of other folks who had been supporting uh, the work that I just presented. Thank you again very much. I'll stop right here. Time for questions. So very fascinating talk, Bharat. So it's indeed uh, everything rocks over here. Uh, I just want, uh, I just have a few questions. The first one is uh, you uh, for the first part, the freestanding. Uh, so you mentioned that we are doing away with the limited strain. Uh, so, but kind of complex oxides, they feed on the strain for the different physical properties. For example, a double exchange, if you grow it on different kinds of a strain that's very modified and the magnetism is quite modified. Has there been any work on, magnet, on the freestanding and the magnetization studies of these? Yes, there had been a lot of study done. I shouldn't say a lot because total number of paper are about 70, but there had been study done where people make 
LSMO, for example, they strain it and they see your properties is enhanced, magnetism is enhanced and so on. So for LSMO? Or LSMO, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Probably the one that I read was on the contrary then. Uh, so how thick are these uh, freestanding films? So what people have grown so far, I think uh, to my knowledge, what had been shown is 10 nanometer or around that. We have gone down to now four unit cell. Four unit cell, which we can't see, we just transfer them onto a ST, uh, on TM grid and do, do TM and in TM we do see some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so four unit cell is down to that we can get. There is one paper from Harold Wong group where he has grown one layer, but then it's not membrane, it's sandwich and you can say it's membrane. So, so the remote epitaxy, so graphene, if I'm not mistaken, has got a very different lattice constant as compared to all the other materials that you're depositing. So what's the trick there? So is the strain retained when you lift it off or when you transfer it? We don't know the answer. That's a, that's a wonderful question. That's one of the things that I was interested in in studying, but here the question is even simpler. Are there any remote epitaxy going on? And the answer is there's a fraction of the film are growing remote epitaxy, rest all are wonder wall epitaxy. So if I want to answer the question that you just said, I think I will be mixing things up. So that's a wonderful question. I think this has to be investigated, but right now I don't think anybody at this uh, position where they can answer this question. Um, uh, I, we think, yes, um, uh, we think if we have a one layer of continuous graphene transferred onto oxide substrate, we will suppress wonder wall epitaxy. Okay. Uh, because then interaction from the substrate will be far uh, stronger than otherwise. Uh, right now, the graphene that we are putting on top of STO, they are bilayer, and there is also air gap between the graphene and the substrate which further weaken the, you know, the surface penetration of the surface potential, uh, which, is the re which is the reason why we only see remote epitaxy, mostly see remote epitaxy and less of uh, remote epitaxy. So I think we are working with people like uh, Josh Robinson, who is well known in the field for 2D material, where they, they know what they do with the 2D material transfer. Uh, all I can tell you, they are not at the stage where we can get a you know, really good quality 2D material transfer onto this film to answer those kind of questions. And one more question. So uh, do you think the grain boundaries in this uh, graphene layer is going to affect the growth? I mean, what is the role which will be yeah. played by the um, Our answer is I do think grain boundaries plays a role because that's a weaker places. So I didn't show you those data in AFM. If you look at a large area AFM, you'll find some places um, there are a lot more islands than other places. And the length scale of them are microns, which are also the length scale of those grains, that distribution is a grain boundary for, for graphene. So we do think that near grain boundaries, uh, maybe the interaction is a lot stronger because it's a weaker place in graphene. And so things are more attracted to that place as opposed to other places. So answer is, I don't know. But based on what we have done is we do think grain boundaries plays a role. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, so I just had this question that when you remove the, uh, your membrane, uh, doesn't it strain relax, especially if it's... It does. Um, so uh, excellent question. So uh, membrane, when we grow on sacrificial layer, lattice parameter is typically 3.92 angstrom for STO, mm -hmm. grown on strontium oxide or barium oxide on other substrate. When we remove them and transfer them on ST on silicon, uh, uh, lattice parameter comes down to 3.905. Um, so that's a fully bulk like. What we have seen, and I do want to mention this to the crowd, we have been seeing something unusual with STO. So please comment if you have any thoughts on it. For last years or so, we have been transferring STO membrane onto a silicon substrate. And in many cases, we see slightly lower lattice parameter than bulk. A lot of cases, we do see lattice parameter is 3.89, not 3.905. And we do know these are grown within the growth window. Uh, we have done all sort of, you know, maybe ripples is forming, maybe something is happening, which is giving a lower lattice parameter. So uh, anyway, that's, a, that's just a out loud telling additional Thanks. thoughts. We also have 
electric uh, data on these, um, what do you call the ultra thin uh, films that you have? So um, we, have, uh, we have done the dielectric measurement on 20 nanometer barium titanate. And the dielectric constant is about 400 nanometer, 400, I'm sorry, for 20 nanometer barium titanate membrane. For, um, for STO membrane, for regardless of thickness, dielectric content is about 280 nanometer. And regardless of thickness, I should say, we started from 30 nanometer up. When we go to two, three nanometer, we have not done any dielectric. So typically in PLD grown STO films, it is known that it actually decreases with a reduced thickness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we, so that's excellent. We, we don't know. That's something we want to see the dead layer effect, what is happening, the size effect and so on in these membranes. That's something we want to do. We, we don't know answer to that. But based on what we have done up above 30 nanometer, they all look same. The thickness of, the, the thickness of, of this membrane, I generally, you, you are trying to make it thinner, right? But uh, to make it them thick, is it going to change a lot in terms of, of quality of the, let's say, I don't know, I want to make a 100 nanometer thick membrane. Is it going to, or 500 nanometer thick membrane? Is it going to change a lot uh, your processes or, or is it, or not? I mean, uh, it, so there is an advantage in going uh, thinner or thicker? Yeah. I mean, um, I would say, depending on which material you are growing, it, it, that answer, answer to that question can be different. For STO, grown on strontium oxide, we have grown four unit cell and separated, transferred, exfoliated successfully. We have grown five of five, 600, 800 nanometer thick membrane, uh, thick film, and then created membrane. They are all STO structurally from X-ray diffraction and TEM. So they are not different. But if you are, you know, answer to that question can be different if you are trying to grow a material which are solid solution to uh, this uh, binary oxide, then one has to be careful. Um, then time might matter, grow time. All right. Uh, so let's uh, thank uh, Bharat again for a very nice talk thank on you. this uh, field.